This presentation will cover concentrated leak erosion, which is a form of scour erosion. Following this presentation, you will be able to identify the internal erosion process of concentrated leak erosion. You'll be able to explain where such leaks may occur, and you'll be able to assess the likelihood of initiating this mechanism. This presentation will provide an overview of the internal erosion process of concentrated leak erosion and will describe the hydraulic conditions for its initiation. Let's begin with an overview of the internal erosion process. Concentrated leak erosion is a form of scour that refers to an internal erosion process involving leakage flow through an opening in the soil or rock mass. Openings can be cracks, gaps, or other defects in the embankment, or open defects in the soil or rock mass in the foundation. The process is distinguished from other processes of internal erosion by the soil particles eroding from the sides of the opening. This figure shows a continuous defect, a horizontal crack through a homogeneous earth fill dam. Leakage flow through the crack applies hydraulic shear stresses or tractive forces onto the walls of the crack, and this can lead to particle detachment from the walls of the crack. When an embankment dam is constructed, differential settlements occur across the valley, resulting from parts of the dam being higher than others, settling more as the dam is constructed. This can lead to horizontal strains and potentially cracking or low stress zones susceptible to hydraulic fracture. This is most likely to occur where the abutments are steep, where there is a step in the foundation profile, or where there is compressible soil in part of the foundation. After construction, the embankment continues to settle differentially, resulting in additional stresses and strains. These are inevitable and occur even for well-compacted dams. The figure at the top left illustrates how differential settlements may also result in gaps or cracks opening adjacent to spillway structures. At the bottom, Reclamation's Red Willow Dam experienced cracking over the old creek channel and over the conduit. It has since been upgraded with filters. The cracking over the conduit is a result of the conduit being founded on rock and large differential settlements between the conduit and the embankment in the valley resulting from foundation settlement. The cracking over the old creek section is a result of settlements in the creek section being smaller than in the adjacent embankment. The depth of alluvium beneath the embankment in the creek section was smaller because the rock level was higher here than elsewhere and the creek was infilled with embankment material. Stepping through the images, you can see how the accumulation of tensile strains increase post-construction settlement as a function of embankment height. Hydraulic fracture involves the formation and extension of an opening in a soil mass due to increasing water pressure. In the figure, an initial opening forms on the upstream side of the core due to a defect or crack. The water pressure in the initial water-filled crack increases for example, due to an increase in reservoir level. If the water pressure in the crack exceeds the sum of the minor principal stress and tensile capacity of the soil at the crack tip, then the crack is jacked open and it extends further into the core. The process progresses from upstream to downstream. Hydraulic fracturing can also occur due to the use of high pressures when drilling with water or air or by pressure grouting. Whether erosion will initiate in concentrated leaks in an embankment or its foundation depends on whether a continuous crack or flaw exists. Whether the forces imposed on the sides of the crack by the water flowing through the crack are sufficient to initiate erosion, and whether the flow velocity is sufficient to transport the detached particles in the crack. In this typical concentrated leak erosion event tree, Node 1 assesses the likelihood of a transverse crack existing in the embankment. Given the crack exists, Node 2 assesses the likelihood of initiation. These two nodes are the primary focus of this presentation. The remaining nodes will be discussed in separate presentations. Node 3 assesses the likelihood of an unfiltered exit. Nodes 4 and 6 assess the mechanical condition for progression, while Node 5 assesses the hydraulic condition for progression. Nodes 7 and 8 are unsuccessful intervention and breach, respectively. 
It is good practice to use the generic sequence of events or event tree as a starting point for potential failure mode evaluation, but then to adapt it for site-specific conditions. Not all nodes may apply to a specific dam. In this example, the typical event tree for concentrated leak erosion was adopted to assess the mechanism at the soil rock interface. Node 1 assesses the likelihood of a continuous open rock defect existing in contact with the embankment. Node 2 was added to assess the effectiveness of any foundation treatment. Given the cracker gap exists, Node 3 assesses the likelihood of initiation. Node 4 assesses the probability of an unfiltered exit. Node 5 assesses the potential for clogging, which could include swelling along the erosion pathway. And Node 6 assesses the mechanical condition for progression. The influence of varying crack widths across the flow path and the foundation on the gradient will be discussed at the end of this presentation. It can affect the hydraulic gradient and potential for clogging. Next, let's cover the situations where concentrated leaks may occur, where information is available for estimating crack width and depth of a given mechanism, it is included. A broader discussion is provided at the end and in the toolbox overview. This figure shows failure paths that can be associated with structures, foundations, or poor details in the dam. These include locations adjacent to the spillway walls at A and B, adjacent to the outlet conduit at C, and over irregularities in the foundation at D for the upper part of the embankment and at E for the lower part, where low stresses and potential for cracking and hydraulic fracture due to differential settlement are likely. Potential failure paths can also be associated with high permeability layers through any other portion of the embankment. This figure shows some common locations where cracks and defects are often observed. The worst location is usually where two or more factors combine. Understanding the design of the dam, given the geology and seepage history, are key. Searching for potential flaw locations is a very important step in the risk assessment. There are a wide range of mechanisms that can create cracks or other defects through which concentrated leaks can develop. Many of these are related to differential settlement and poorly compacted or high permeability zones in the embankment. The next two slides present a list of potential mechanisms that can cause concentrated leaks. The initiating mechanism numbers correspond to the Fell et al. 2008 methodology, which is used in the RMC Concentrated Leak Erosion Crack Width and Depth Toolbox. Other mechanisms are shown at the end of this list that should also be considered where applicable. The following slides will step through the mechanisms, roughly in order by internal erosion mechanism. This slide shows situations in which cross-valley differential settlement may lead to cracking or extension strains and low stress zones subject to hydraulic fracture. As a dam is constructed, the partially compacted soil in the embankment consolidates and settlement occurs. Where the valley sides are steep or have steps in the profile, differential settlements occur and can lead to tensile or low stress zones in which cracks may form and hydraulic fracture can occur. The areas susceptible to cracking are shown for steep abutments and steps in the foundation profile on the left for IM1 and IM9. Staged embankment surfaces can also behave like a step in the foundation profile, as shown on the right for IM6. Tensile zones develop during the varying stages of embankment construction. This can lead to cracks at depth, but which then close up as additional fill is placed. The following sequence of slides shows the development of minor principal stresses from finite element modeling as an embankment is constructed above a bench in a steep abutment. It should be recognized that these stresses are inevitable, even in well-designed and constructed dams, and are not caused by poor design or construction practice. The following animations progress through the modeling of embankment construction. As fill is placed in layers, tensile zones initially develop above the rock bench and along the steep abutment. These appear as red and orange colored zones. As successive layers are placed, the tensile zones disappear and go back into compression. 
Therefore, if cracks develop, they're likely to close up as construction proceeds. However, the cracks can remain open or reopen after construction, even at depth due to ongoing settlement. As the fill construction nears the crest, tensile zones develop in the fill adjacent to the steep abutment. The tensile zones in the fill adjacent to the steep abutment remain upon completion of the embankment construction. IM2 and IM22 are for cracking or a gap that may form adjacent to walls or cliffs due to the earth fill settling away from the wall during and after construction, especially with steep walls. Deformations of flexible or under-designed retaining walls, such as those designed for active instead of at-rest earth pressure, can also lead to cracks or gaps. IM3 is for cross-valley arching, which can occur in narrow and steep valleys, as shown on the left. Vertical stresses are shed onto the sides of the valley, which can lead to hydraulic fracture. The figure on the right is the center line for Corps of Engineers Mud Mountain Dam in Washington. The 425-foot-high dam extends across a narrow rock gorge with steep volcanic rock walls more than 275 feet high. Defects in the core were found and consisted of loose zones and voids due to settlement and arching of the core material within the narrow, steep rock canyon. The dam was remediated with a cutoff wall and remedial grouting. For IM4, more compressible outer shell zones can cause a down drag effect on a stiff core zone, which can induce longitudinal cracking in the core. Longitudinal cracking can change to transverse cracking on the abutments. In addition, longitudinal cracks on both shoulders may intersect to provide a zone of transverse cracking from upstream to downstream across the core. This slide illustrates situations which may cause differential settlement in the foundation of dams leading to cracking, lateral strains, and low stress zones subject to hydraulic fracture. IM5 is for cracks in the upper part of the embankment, and IM11 is for cracking in the middle and lower parts of the embankment. At the top, differential foundation support conditions across the profile include soil and rock. In the middle, a very compressible soil of limited aerial extent is present in the foundation. At the bottom, differential settlement occurs over the conduit excavation backfill. Desiccation cracking is most likely to be an issue in climates with average annual net evaporation greater than 36 inches, in high plasticity cores, and where there is no surface layer over the core. Desiccation cracking does not commonly persist to a great depth so it only becomes an issue for water levels near the crest. IM7 is for desiccation cracking at the crest. Desiccation cracking may also occur on seasonal shutdown or staged construction surfaces. IM8, if good construction practices were not followed and in soil exposed to drying during construction, particularly if it was compacted very wet. For IM10, vertical stresses in the core zone can be reduced due to arching between outer shell zones, which have a higher modulus. This is most likely to be a problem for cores with a very narrow width and for soil subject to collapse compression on saturation. For example, a poorly compacted soil placed dry of optimum moisture content. IM12 is for small scale irregularities in the foundation of the core that can lead to cracking or low stresses conducive to hydraulic fracture. For cracking or low stresses to occur, the small-scale irregularities need to be persistent over all or most of the distance across the core and have steps greater than approximately 3 to 5 percent of the embankment height. There are examples of these irregularities being formed by constructing haul roads across the core and steps in slope correction concrete. When embankments experience a large earthquake, they often settle and spread perpendicular to the center line. Many exhibit longitudinal cracking and some transverse cracking. IM13 is for seismic cracks in the upper part of the embankment. The same locations for cracking under seismic loading apply, but the earthquake accentuates them by causing additional deformations which occur rapidly. If liquefaction occurs, deformations are likely to be large and the likelihood of cracking is greater. 
These may be estimated by numerical analysis methods. The top left photo shows the longitudinal cracks along the crest of an embankment dam following the Bhuj earthquake in India. The reservoir was empty at the time of the earthquake. At the top right, Fujinuma Dam failed in 2011 due to foundation liquefaction or strength loss caused by the Tohoku, Japan magnitude 9.0 earthquake. This is the first case of a dam failure caused by an earthquake with life loss. As a result of the same earthquake, the photo at the bottom right shows the slumping of the Hanauma River left levee induced by liquefaction. Crack depth and hence likelihood of initiation are a function of both the earthquake and coincident water level, as shown in the table to the far right. Initiation of concentrated leak erosion depends on the water level and the depth of cracking. I am 16 and I am 17 are for freezing. Frost effects include extra water drawn into the soil by capillary action, causing pumping and ice lenses. This can lead to heave and cracking or loosening, resulting in a high permeability layer. This may occur on seasonal shutdown or staged construction surfaces, if good construction practices were not followed, and adjacent to conduits due to freezing and differential movements, even if the soil is well compacted. Core materials most susceptible to freezing and ice lens formation include silts, clayey silts, silty sands, silty gravels, and clayey sands and gravels with a plasticity index less than 12. For cutoff trenches, concentrated leak erosion of the core can occur at the core foundation contact by water flowing in joints in the rock foundation. Concentrated leak erosion can also occur in a crack or hydraulic fracture across a cutoff trench and can be evaluated in the HF core worksheet. Hydraulic fracture in a cutoff trench needs to coincide with an open joint or coarse grain soil layer downstream that provides an unfiltered exit, and hence the assessed probability should consider the likelihood of this coincidence. The hydraulic gradient used in the assessment of initiation of concentrated leak erosion should be based on the estimated hydraulic gradient across the cutoff trench. Cracking, hydraulic fracture, or openings can occur in poorly compacted cohesive soils, often compacted at more than 2% dry of optimum. This is particularly so for dispersive soils. The mechanism is potentially of two types. First, the soil behaves as a series of clods with openings between the clods in which water passes. Second, the soil collapses on saturation, forming a flaw or open pathway in which the water flows. Fell et al. 2008 provides some suggested guidance for estimating the amount of collapse settlement as a fraction of the layer thickness and the degree of compaction of the core. The method described here is used on the collapse settlement worksheet in the RMC Concentrated Leak Erosion Crack Width and Depth Toolbox. Other places to consider include any interface of the embankment with a concrete structure. Where there is a wraparound junction between a concrete gravity dam and an embankment dam, differential settlements may occur, resulting in a crack or gap adjacent to the wall. There is also the potential for poor compaction. Monolith sections with overhangs are sometimes used on upstream and downstream faces and can result in settlement and a gap beneath them. Thus, the effective seepage path length may be reduced to the width of the monolith since full reservoir head would be transferred to the end of the monolith due to the gaps. Many concentrated leak erosion failures and incidents have occurred at conduits embedded in the embankment. Hydraulic fracturing can occur due to stress distributions, resulting from the stiff conduit and its less stiff surrounding soil and low principal stresses. Hydraulic fracturing can also occur on the sides of the conduits, constructed in trenches and where sharp corners are present in the concrete or concrete surround. Desiccation cracking can occur in the sides of the conduit excavation during construction. Poor compaction can occur due to closely spaced collars or concrete formed with a corrugated steel sheet or other non-smooth formwork, as well as at narrow spaces adjacent to the conduit. Core compaction is likely to lead to collapsed settlement of the soil on saturation, forming a gap adjacent to the conduit. Leaks or deterioration by aging, open joints, or other defects due to corrosion or cracked conduits after differential settlements can also lead to concentrated leak erosion, as well as internal migration.
Geological processes which can lead to the formation of open or infill defects or solution features in rock include defects related to stress relief effects in the valley sides, such as at East Branch Dam, defects related to stress relief effects in the valley floor, like valley bulge or rebound, solution features for rock subject to solution, like limestone, dolomite, marble, gypsum, and hydrite and halite, defects associated with landslides, faults, and shear zones, and blast-induced fractures and abutments, cut-off trenches, and other locations. Inadequate foundation treatment was mentioned earlier in the presentation. At the top right, gaps in the infill material may form by collapsed settlement of the infill material upon saturation, incomplete filling of the defect, or hydraulic fracture through the infill. The other erosion diagrams are from the independent panel report on the Teton Dam failure. The figure to the left shows that under high water pressure, the pipe is likely to enlarge by separation of the fill from the rock surface. At the bottom middle, an open joint is not sealed by dental concrete or slush grout. At the bottom right, an open joint at a step in the rock surface is shown where erosion would occur even more readily because of the reduction of stresses in the reentrant corner due to the arching and poor compaction in the corner. Earth fissures can occur where the ground subsidence causes differential settlements. Possible causes include groundwater extraction, oil extraction, and underground mining. Earth fissures can be along the edges of the subsidence area, or as shown in the figures, where the thickness of the soil deposit varies. Animal burrows can lead to situations where there are nearly continuous holes through an embankment or situations where high gradients between holes may result in initiation of concentrated leak erosion. In the photos, large rodent burrows associated with assumed beaver activity at Natomas Levee were observed by operation and maintenance personnel. A beaver was actually observed carrying a large tree branch towards the levee, disappearing at the toe, and then reappearing on the opposite levee toe, still carrying a branch. Upon walking down the levee slope, personnel found a large entrance hole. An investigation was undertaken to investigate the size, magnitude, and continuity of the beaver den network. The network penetrated through much of the embankment. Vegetation growing on embankments can lead to situations which may lead to concentrated leak erosion. Decaying roots or roots penetrating into an open joint and cracks in the foundation rock can create seepage paths. Overturned trees can create shortened seepage paths. Root penetration of conduit joints and joints in other concrete structures can open the joints to allow erosion into or out of the conduit or wall. Roots can also clog underdrain systems and vegetation in general can hinder visual inspection. The hole in the photo at the top right was created on the waterside levee slope by a rotted tree stump. The photo on the bottom right is of a breach due to overtopping, but it exposed large roots that penetrated the embankment. More and less likely factors for the geometric conditions. This first table from Creo de Santos provides an overview of the various mechanisms for transverse cracks and hydraulic fracture in the embankment from Fell et al. 2008. Similarly, this next table is from the same source and provides an overview of the various mechanisms for poorly compacted or high permeability zones in the embankment. With regards to cross-valley differential settlement, valley profiles with a step in the upper part of the abutment and subject to large post-construction settlements are most likely to be subject to cracking. This conclusion is based on case studies and parametric numerical analyses. As previously mentioned, estimated localized strains greater than 1% and in particular greater than 2% are likely to be indicative of conditions conducive to transverse cracking. He et al. 2019 provides some general guidance on the likely width and depth of cracking based on numerical modeling that are suitable for preliminary assessments. Case studies provide insights into conditions in which cracks have been observed in embankment dams. Most dams settle less than 0.5% in the 10 years after construction, as illustrated by these two figures. 
which is less than those in which cracking has mostly been observed. Starting with the plot on the left, many dams with cracking experience 1% to 2% post-construction settlement as a percentage of the maximum embankment height. However, cracking was also observed where post-construction settlements were significantly smaller, but other unfavorable conditions generally existed. A similar plot of post-construction settlements was performed for 20 Corps of Engineers Louisville District dams. J. Edward Rausch Dam experienced settlement adjacent to a spillway wall, and Mrs. Sinawa Dam experienced settlement due to internal migration of the embankment into the foundation. This table provides likelihood factors for maximum settlement measured anywhere in the embankment expressed as a ratio of the maximum embankment height. This table can be used as a starting point, but the risk team must develop project-specific more likely and less likely factors to guide subjective probability estimation. Evidence from the analysis of case history data indicates localized strains greater than 1%, and in particular greater than 2%, are likely to be indicative of conditions conducive to transverse cracking. Valley profiles with a step in the upper part of the abutment or with part or all of the valley with compressible soil in the foundation, are most likely to be susceptible to cracking because of larger strains and localization of strains. Based on the results of parametric analyses, this table provides some general conclusions on the conditions likely to result in larger localized strains. This table from the Best Practices Manual can be used to help assess the likelihood of initiation of concentrated leak erosion. It can be used as a starting point, but the risk team must develop project-specific, more likely and less likely factors to guide subjective probability estimation. The factors in this portion of the table address seepage, soil erodibility, cracking, sinkholes or depressions, and loose or soft zones in the core. The factors in this portion of the table address construction practices, core width, differential settlement of the foundation, and foundation profile under the core. The factors in this portion of the table address observed settlement, foundation preparation, and abutment slopes. The factors in this portion of the table address differential settlement due to a closure section, seasonal shutdown layers, embankment zoning and overall geometry, and the quality of construction and quality control. The factors in this portion of the table address lift thickness, core materials, desiccation cracking, and instrumentation. And the factors in this portion of the table address reservoir operation, vegetation, and age of the dam. This table from McCook and Gortry in 2009 can be used to help assess the likelihood of hydraulic fracture. Finite element programs like GeoStudio Sigma W can also help assess the potential for hydraulic fracture in the embankment for new construction. By comparing the predicted lateral stresses to predicted reservoir pressures, the likelihood of hydraulic fracture on first filling of the reservoir can be assessed. The effects of various design parameters, such as degree of compaction, placement water content, removal of foundations, shaping of transverse slopes, and other factors can also be assessed. Crack width and depth. Estimates of crack widths and depths is very approximate and highly uncertain. The assessment requires careful consideration and analysis, probably by more than one method. ICOLD Bulletin 164 provides a summary of suggested likely maximum crack depths and widths due to cross-valley differential settlement or differential settlement in the foundation. It is based on Fell et al. 2008, which provides a methodology to estimate crack width and depth. Initial estimates of crack depths can be made using analytical methods, but case histories can provide some ground truth of what has actually happened. The table on the left summarizes the results of maximum depth of transverse cracking and dams worldwide performed by Virginia Tech for reclamation. 
the table on the right summarizes the cracking observed in dams and some of the factors which influence whether cracking may occur. More recently, Fell and Foster have developed new tables for crack width based on localized tensile strain, which is the maximum total post-construction settlement of the crest as a percentage of embankment height. The higher the tensile strain, the larger the crack. If monitoring data is not available, assume 0.25% for dams built after 1950 and 0.5% for dams built before 1950. The top table reports the estimated crack width in millimeters, and the bottom table gives the ratio of the crack depth to crack width. Cracks should be uniformly tapered from the crest to the base of the crack. Tables for estimating crack width and depth were recently developed by Fell and Foster based on case data. The higher the liquid limit, the wider and deeper the desiccation crack. The conditions on the crest also play a role, with thicker gravel roads limiting the crack size. Desiccation cracking is not expected beneath sealed roads or concrete pavements. Pels and Fell 2002 and 2003 and Fell et al. 2008 developed a methodology to assess the likelihood of cracking due to an earthquake for IM-13. The likely damage class is first estimated based on PGA on bedrock and the moment magnitude. Then judgment is used to estimate the likelihood of cracking, crack width, and crack depth, considering other potential failure modes with settlement-induced transverse cracking. These figures are for earthfill and rockfill dams. There are other figures for hydraulic earthfill and concrete-faced rockfill dams, but the case histories are even more limited. Fellas Hall 2008 provides some suggested guidance for crack depth based on climate. However, the most reliable source for depth of frost penetration is the local building code or structural load data tool for UFC 3-301-01 for Department of Defense locations from the whole building design guide. Identifying the location and conditions for cracking or hydraulic fracture to occur is still subjective. The state of the art is poor for prediction of likelihood of cracking or low stress zones subject to hydraulic fracture, and it is even poorer for predicting depth and width of cracking and the width of hydraulic fractures. Numerical modeling can help inform judgment. Little research is available on collapse settlement, however. The hydraulic condition for initiation requires an estimate of the crack location and geometry, the applied hydraulic shear stress in the pipe or crack, and the critical shear stress. Concentrated leak erosion will initiate when the applied hydraulic shear stress exceeds a critical value as described in node 2 of the typical event tree. This requires estimating the hydraulic shear stresses in the crack for the water level under consideration taking into account the geometry of the core and assumed crack dimensions and location relative to the water level so the flow gradient can be determined. A simplified crack geometry is usually assumed, which may result in very conservative estimates. As such, sensitivity analysis is strongly suggested. When assessing initiation, potential head losses in the zones upstream and downstream in zone dams may need to be considered when estimating the gradients in the crack. Once the hydraulic shear stress has been estimated, it is compared to the critical shear stress, which will initiate erosion for the soil in the core at the degree of saturation of the soil on the sides of the crack. The equation for estimating hydraulic shear stress is shown on the slide and is equal to the product of the unit weight of water, the hydraulic gradient of flow in the pipe or crack, and the ratio of the cross-sectional area of the crack to its wetted perimeter. The pipe or flaw is assumed to have a uniform cross-section, and head loss is assumed to be linear. Uniform frictional resistance is also assumed along the surface of the flaw. These figures provide examples of transverse flaws, pipes or cracks, for which the hydraulic shear stress will be estimated. The geometries include a cylindrical pipe, a horizontal crack, a vertical rectangular crack, and vertical tapered crack. 
For the case of tailwater below the base of a cylindrical pipe or horizontal crack, the hydraulic gradient across the core is estimated by dividing the hydraulic head difference by the length of the leakage pathway through the core. A homogeneous cohesive embankment is shown on the left, and the slope of the upstream and downstream faces are used to estimate the length. A zoned embankment is shown on the right, where the upstream and downstream zones are very permeable, for example, rock fill. The slopes of the upstream and downstream central core are used to estimate the length. For the case of tailwater below the base of a vertical crack, an equivalent length must be estimated. A homogeneous cohesive embankment is shown on the left, and the hydraulic head loss occurs over length L along the base of the crack, measured from the downstream face to a projection of the point where the water level intersects the upstream face. The slope of the upstream and downstream faces are used to estimate the length. A zoned embankment is shown on the right, where the upstream and downstream zones are very permeable. The hydraulic head loss occurs over length L along the base of the crack, measured from the downstream face of the core to a projection of the point where the water level intersects the upstream face of the core. The slopes of the upstream and downstream central core are used to estimate the length. An embankment dam may have multiple exit locations. An example is a homogeneous cohesive embankment with a partial height chimney filter, as shown in these figures for the case of tailwater below the base of a vertical crack. If the base of the crack is above the top of the chimney filter, as shown on the left, the hydraulic head loss occurs over length L along the base of the crack measured from the downstream face to a projection of the point where the water level intersects the upstream face. The slopes of the upstream and downstream faces are used to estimate the length. If the base of the crack is below the top of the chimney filter, as shown on the right, the hydraulic head loss occurs over length L along the base of the crack, measured from the downstream intersection with the filter to a projection of the point where the water level intersects the upstream face of the core. While the slope of the upstream face is still used, the downstream slope of the chimney filter is used instead of the downstream face to estimate the length. To calculate the hydraulic shear stress in a pipe or crack, Juan 2006 developed equations for cylindrical pipes and vertical rectangular cracks with no tailwater. The Corps of Engineers expanded these equations to include tailwater and developed equations for horizontal cracks and vertical tapered cracks. For cylindrical pipes and horizontal cracks, H1 minus H2 divided by L can be reduced to the hydraulic gradient I. Therefore, the same equation can be used when the tailwater is below the base of crack and the gradient I is equal to H1 over L. For transverse cracks, the width of the crack W is very small compared to the crack length parallel to the center line X, the hydraulic head at the upstream end of the crack H1, and the crack depth D. The width of the crack will be on the order of several millimeters, while the crack length, hydraulic head, and crack depth will be on the order of several feet. If W is assumed to be zero, where it is added to these terms, and H2 equals zero for the no tailwater condition in the middle column, the approximations shown in the last column are obtained. If you do not have access to a toolbox analysis, you can use these simple equations to obtain a decent estimate. Another way to use these relationships is to assess the critical pipe diameter or crack width for initiation of concentrated leak erosion. Once the critical diameter or width is estimated, the risk assessment team can then consider the likelihood of having a pipe or crack of those dimensions. An estimate of critical shear stress is still needed and a range of values should be considered. A very recent paper from Pearson et al. 2023 suggests that the shear stresses will be much higher in transverse cracks than those calculated using the average gradient method we just covered. Their testing found hydraulic shear stresses on the sides of the crack to be greater at the water surface than lower in the crack. Hydraulic shear stresses were also found to be greater at the downstream most end of the crack than at the upstream end. If erosion initiates at the downstream end and there is no downstream filter, the process will progress upstream and will not stop unless the crack closes by swell. The new data suggests it is reasonable to assume initiation in nearly all cases. 
The RMC Concentrated Leak Erosion Toolbox uses the average gradient method and will give lower hydraulic shear stresses and, as a result, the probability of initiation will be lower. The difference in how flow through the crack is assumed is shown by the figure on the right. The gradient at the end of the crack is much steeper than what is considered for the average method, shaded in blue. The average gradient method is still recommended for conduit-like conditions and poorly compacted layers within an embankment, just not transverse cracks at the crest. Scour can also occur along continuous open rock defects in the foundation. The method for assessing the likelihood of initiation of concentrated leak erosion is just like for pipes and cracks in the embankment. For erosion to continue through an open defect, the joint opening size for a continuing erosion condition must be greater than the D95 of the adjacent soil. However, the hydraulic gradient may vary across the flow path in the foundation as the width of the open defects varies. This is shown in the series of figures on the right. Erosion will initiate in the narrow defects where gradients are high in preference to the wider sections of defect. Toolbox Overview The RMC Concentrated Leak Erosion Crack Width and Depth Toolbox provides resources and methods to estimate the width and depth of transverse cracks that result from different causes, including differential settlement, hydraulic fracturing, earthquake, and collapse settlement due to poor compaction. The RMC Concentrated Leak Erosion Initiation Toolbox calculates the hydraulic shear stress in a pipe or crack and compares it to the critical shear stress of the soil. Multiple crack geometries can be assessed. For parameter combinations where the stress exceeds the critical shear stress, initiation is assumed to occur. The toolbox will also calculate the critical pipe diameter or crack width for a given critical shear stress and hydraulic loading. Lastly, the probability tables developed by Fellatol 2008 can be used to estimate the probability of initiation based on the soil classification, the width or diameter of the crack, and the average gradient through the crack. The primary references used to develop this presentation are listed on the following slides. This concludes the presentation on concentrated leak erosion.